Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Suzanne Miller, and I'm a principal investigator in the SEI Software Solutions Division. Today, I'm very happy to be joined by Alejandro Gomez, a software engineer in the SEI CERT Division. We're here to talk about a recent engagement where he deployed DevSecOps practices to managing the competing forces of developer velocity and cybersecurity enforcement. And we'll talk about what both of those are in a few minutes. Welcome, Alejandro. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to see you here. Um, let's your your new face for our podcast audience. So let's start by having you tell us about yourself, what brought you here to the SEI, and the work that you do here. Sure, thank you. Well, um, there are many reasons, uh, but one that I can think about uh, that stands out is uh, I've been very interested and applying basic research into practice. Usually you'll get one or the other. And after being a couple of years on the industry, uh, there's been, uh, I've been wanting to take some of the great ideas that have been developed in some of the academic environments like CMU and in the general computing science community and uh, just try to apply them into practice um, and see what good results can come out of that. And the SEI, I think, has been a great place that has allowed me to do that, both in terms of the people that work in it, uh, who are smart and can apply and can apply the research and also know how to how to code, and also just the the clients with which we work with, which have been great. Yes, I mean you're really talking about the basic mission of the SEI to transition good practices out to our communities and and particularly. DOD and related since that's our FFRDC sponsor. So um, so you're in the right place. So that's good <laughs> to have you here. Um, the recent work that you've been doing, uh, let us know a little bit about sort of what is it that led you to need to uh, figure out a way to manage these two forces together of, of velocity and, and uh, cybersecurity enforcement? Sure. So I was recently uh, tasked to help a client uh, that we, work, we were working with where uh, they were developing a pipeline and had a number of teams working on this pipeline to uh, develop and deploy code to production. Um, there were a number of issues that were going on at the moment. Um, specifically related to security. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was a lot of pressure uh, from management to try to get some of this work through and be able to attain some of the goals that they had. This is something that's pretty common you know, in, in other places, and you see it in the industry all the time. You, you have these goals that you're trying to set, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a lot of complexity that needs to be managed. And as we've seen uh, in the past couple of years, security is becoming an ever more important uh, topic that not just developers have to uh, be aware of, but also executives and leadership. So uh, in talking about security and uh, the, the velocity that is being done, I just want to go over some of the definitions of these things. For security, I want to defer to some of the NIST um, software, uh, secure software development framework that has been developed there. Um, they identify security with protecting the organization, protecting the software, uh, creating well-developed software, and also responding to vulnerabilities. So it's not just trying to lock down everything up. It's also uh, a lot more dynamic. It's also um, knowing what needs to be in place first. So there's these different components when it comes to security. There's also different layers in which uh, security can be applied to uh, from the, as I said, from the business level down to the software. Uh, on the velocity side, so this is very interesting because this has been hotly debated for many years. Uh, it first started with number of, number of lines of code uh, that a person would code in a day, and that was measured as productivity. Uh, then it developed into, well, how many days does it take for you to develop something? Uh, and then we had this concept of uh, points and Fibonacci numbering with Agile. 
So at the place where I was working with, uh, we were uh, we were working with uh, the number of days that it would take to develop something. Uh, I would just make a note that th th there's some drawbacks to this approach, and some of those things were later improved, which is that developers by nature are optimistic creatures, and we liked to point things to say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll be able to develop that in a day or two, and it ends up taking four or five days, and it throws schedules off. Um, one, uh, one, de one definition of velocity that I really like is, was made by Dora, which is a report uh, that's created by Google every year uh, on DevOps. It's an excellent uh, report based on psychological research uh, that they have. Uh, well, not just psychological, but also uh, uh, statistical, um, where they have uh, narrowed it down to frequent commits, frequent deployment, and a fast turnover rate are some of the key things that some of the best companies have uh, that have allowed them to be extremely productive. And, uh, and, so, and I just want to mm -hmm. interrupt for a second, Alejandro. When you say turnover rate, you're not talking about employee turnover. You're right, talking right, yes. about the, the refresh of the software. Yeah, so by turnover rate, it means like, you know, if, if something goes, to, if there's a bug in production, uh, how long does it take to uh, fix that? Does it take... A couple of minutes, an hour, a month, um, and that's a pretty good predictor of how efficient that organization is. Okay, so you're so you are looking at when you say velocity, you're looking at these more modern concepts, not just how many lines of code per hour. That, Definitely. Uh, when I was growing up, that was the that was the, <laughs> that was the standard, but you know, even then, we didn't like it. Um, so. One thing you didn't mention is how manually the cybersecurity mm -hmm. aspect uh, mm -hmm. was being done. And was that, and when you started this, was this a primarily a manual process to sort of check off these you know, elements mm -hmm. of the NIST standards or was it semi-automated, highly automated? Where did you start from that viewpoint? So at the beginning, uh, the organization was pretty typical of what many organizations have, which is to uh, simply silo security as just another department or team that does these things. So you will have your development team on one silo and your security team on another silo. And then it's just kind of this very factory oriented way of looking at things where developers will create the code, then they hand it off to security and, uh, and so on. Uh, this has a number of drawbacks where, you know, if you have a tight schedule and you're developing code and just before releasing security looks at it and sees that there's a problem, uh, security problem, then it has to go all the way back to development, redevelop, go through the whole process again. A more modern approach is given by uh, DevOps. Uh, and then we can talk about later about some of the added layers that security DevOps provides too. The uh, idea behind DevOps is that we want to, what they say in the industry, shift left. So instead of having security at the end of the process, we want to be able to put it more towards the beginning where we can catch errors and bugs and vulnerabilities quicker. And that will also enable um, a faster delivery. So this is not a simple one of thing. There's many um, practices. It's, uh, there's a culture that needs to be developed. Um, one of the things that we implemented was uh, having automated tests uh, on, a, on the pipeline that will test for security. So instead of having a security team making these reviews before a release, we will have different sets of tests, uh, just a battery of tests to run through whenever, uh, whenever developers are pushing towards their development branch. Uh, we also implemented uh, a standardized template. So you know, instead of having each team just try to implement things on their own. Uh, we're, we want to we want to be able to centralize this process, and so each team is going to have um, a standardized uh, set of tests that they import, and they don't have to worry about that. You know, uh, they developers can keep uh, coding and worrying about what feature it is that they're doing, they don't have to worry about how these security tests are implemented or configured. They just include it on their, on their build file uh, and that'll go through. So that uh, definitely, that significantly improved 
uh, the the time uh, the time that it took from development uh, to deployment, uh, and it also enabled security to um, to be able to have these checks uh, to be uh, be done more consistently. And one of the things I've seen when people uh actually implement these kinds of practices is you get two additional benefits. One is you get a faster learning curve because as the um, developers get uh, notice of, hey, you introduced this vulnerability, you know, early in their development cycle, they can use that knowledge to prevent that vulnerability from other pieces of the of the system that they build. So the earlier we get to them, the, the more likely it is you're gonna have a, a, a better developed code set. Um, That's one benefit. And then the other benefit is because we do all these frequent commits as part of the development process and we're running these these security tests every time, we're building a body of evidence for the security team as to the robustness of what we're doing. When they do something, you know, that's just at the end, there could still be some fragility, you know, in the code, even that they miss. But when you have this sort of industrial view of running the security all the time, we get a lot more robust uh, software at the end end point for them to evaluate. Did you see those kinds of effects in what you did? Correct. No, you have a you raised a, a great point, which is that if there a certain vulnerability is introduced, uh, and by the way, when we talk about the vulnerabilities, it's not even just what the developer is writing in his or her code; it's what kind of um, code libraries they're importing. Right. Or what containers uh, they're they're using to package their code. Once that gets through into a branch that they're going to release, uh, it can become difficult to say, okay, you know, just try to trying to trace where that right. uh, vulnerability came from, uh, and then to stop the entire process from from continuing into deployment. So it's definitely a question of how can we make it so that we take it to the source of where the problem is occurring. Um, and how can we make it so that it is the, the feedback loop that is where the developer notices that there's something, uh, in, uh, there's an insecure practice being committed, how they can roll back on that, make, quick, make, the, make a quick patch and, and push that. So other things that I've seen, um, and you, you talked about some of these, but not about all of these in your blog post. One of the things that um, I find, one of the things you found as a uh, a barrier to developers using the security practices in the initial state was that they actually had to log into a different system. They couldn't just stay in their dev environment to um, to, to implement the security practices and or to test for, the, for that implementation. And, and I mm-hmm. see that a lot. If, is, the more things you make a developer log into, you know, and the more tokens they have on their, you know, on their yes. ID badge chain, you know, the harder it is to get them to actually use those practices and use those tools. But the other thing that um, I've also seen is that some of these tools uh, generate kind of a lot of, you know, what I would call false positives um, in terms yes. of in some settings, this is actually a defect or a vulnerability, but in other settings, it isn't. How did you deal with that aspect of it? Because I've seen that be a barrier to, you know, to developers being willing to use these tools as they go through the pipeline. Can you tell us how you address that? Yeah, that is a great question. And we face that um, that interesting problem that you're mentioning in. Um, I, I would say there were a few things. Number one is be just being aware of um, where the vulnerabilities are coming from. So, you know, there's different analyzers that will do the static code analysis for you, and they will raise, you know, the an issue is the vulnerability. Um, I think that the first step is just uh, informing, your, informing yourself of, okay, I uh, tell me that this is a critical vulnerability. Who says that it, that is? Is it some standard governing body or does it come from, you know, XYZ project up on, on a public repo? Uh, so having that knowledge of, first of all, who is classifying this as a vulnerability is important. Secondly, um, there's a number of ways to deal around that because yes, there can be false positives. Um, one is uh, one thing, one that is uh, I think frequently practiced. I've, I've seen this in in different teams in the industry is to have a security champion on your team. So this is a very pragmatic approach to this, where it's 
sitting back and saying, you know, we won't be able to uh, to educate every single developer in our business as uh, you know someone who knows everything about security. Instead, we'll just have one person in a six person team who will uh, train, who will go through some training, who will develop a little bit more expertise on security. Uh, and this person will have some of that motivation to try to look out for so, uh, some of these things so that when developers are making a merge request and are uh, going through the peer review process of their code, a security champion can see some of these flag vulnerabilities uh, and they will have some more of that expertise to be able to look at it and say, uh, yes, this is definitely a vulnerability that you have. You have a you know, potential SQL injection uh, in here. Um, Another way to 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 look at this is just uh, to um, this is a little bit more of kind of the centralized approach, which is you'll have a security team and they review some of these vulnerabilities individually. One of the advantages of this is that yes, you will have a team of experts who will be able to tell exactly what it is, and they can have a database of these are the vulnerabilities that have been flagged, which are false positive versus false negatives. And um, but the trade-off of this is that then you will have a single point of failure where now if you suddenly have 100 developers and they're creating merge requests and you're just sending all of these things to your security team, they won't be able to handle all of that plus all of the other things that they need to do. So I definitely think there's a, an advantage to when facing some of these problems, but also a little bit more generally, trying to decentralize uh, the solution and trying to take it away from these single points of failures uh, and empowering your team so that they'll, they'll be able to, to resolve those kinds of problems. I, I've seen the security champion work really well on some teams. I, that, that's, that's one of my favorite uh, strategies for that. But before you even got to that, you needed to actually get these folks to actually build the automated pipeline um, that would allow yes. those those uh, tests to be implemented um, at appropriate points. And and why don't you tell us a couple of things that you did in doing that? Because you did uh, a kind of a staged, layered approach to where you <laughs> injected security tests. And so tell us a little bit about yes. that and why you didn't just throw all the security at it all at once. Sure. And um, and it's a it, it's a temptation to just go ahead and, and do that. And I'm just going to put all the tests I can imagine and just make it run through there and say, yep, there it goes. It's secure. Um, the, wh when we first came into this project, we had to look at uh, what are the requirements? You know, how are we working in a constrained environment? Are we working in an environment where it's more open? So depending on the policies um, and the kind of environment that the organization is facing, that will determine a lot of the tests and the kind of security that it, that that is what you're looking for. So, uh, you know, there's a set of common tests that can be done, like static application testing and code quality. But then there's all other things like we're using containers to package our applications. So, and when you're writing your Docker files, you know, you're going to be importing uh, code images from different repositories on the internet. Are those safe? Um, you know, are they, do they have some sort of vulnerability? So it's important to be able to catch those. And also, you know, as the SolarWinds attack has shown and a few recent cybersecurity uh, events have also demonstrated, being able to secure your software supply chain is very important. Uh, so just knowing where, what, how, what code libraries you're importing that will also determine those kinds of tests. And so the idea behind each one of these um, analyzers and tests is that you're going to be mapping these to your policy. You start from your policy and you look for the appropriate tool that is relevant to that. And then uh, in terms of implementing it to your pipeline, uh, there's a number of ways that you can do it. Um, I believe that a... Uh, an efficient and flexible way of doing this is to separate out your tests um, and your policies uh, to become individual stages of your pipeline. Uh, if we if we remember back to um, to Unix, how it implements how it uses pipes, so how you can use the input of one program, uh, sorry, the output of one program to be the input of another, and you can 
connect. That way you can connect these programs together to create new sorts of functionality. It's an amazingly powerful thing because you started from those primitives. Uh, well, I wanted to take this same principle into our pipeline where we have our individual stages and we want to be able to connect them to one another. Um, and that could even lead to other kinds of uh, functionality, which we can uh, get to later. Uh, so this this is a principle, uh, you could say, of modularity, uh, keeping things constrained um, so that they can be used flexibly. Um, and also, again, going back to the policy and asking what is it that we need and then finding the right solutions uh, for that instead of just just going to that shiny new tool that everybody's using at the moment. So that modularity, but also interface management, right? Because the only way that piping really works is if I have publicly understood interfaces and so I can swap Definitely. out the modules if I get new to new shiny tools coming in or new code, new functionality. So Definitely. If, if, if you, you, d you need to have uh, that kind of uh, standardized API between these modules that are communicating, otherwise it just becomes very difficult. Um, so once we make interfaces public and transparent, then uh, somebody else could pick up one of these interfaces and be able to develop their own module. Uh, how exactly that module works, it doesn't, uh, you know, not everybody has to understand that. They just need to understand the interface of that module. And that'll make for a very flexible uh, pipeline uh, that different capabilities can be made from it. And, and one of the things that I'm seeing is that need for, you know, the security posture evolves. We see threats evolve. We see a lot of elements of the environment change. And so I don't want to have to go back and change all of the implementation of everything. I want those interfaces to allow me to swap things out. I have a new right. um, static analyzer that deals with this particular special, you know, uh, aspect of code that's very unique to some setting, I, I want to be able to swap that in. And so that's that's one of the things that this approach is going to enable um, in our in our continuous pipeline development. So 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 you've really kind of uh, been able to and, and in your blog post, you talk about the advantages that you were able to get in terms of speed. So that's the balancing. We haven't really talked much about the the balancing velocity piece, but um, were they Tell us a little bit about sort of what the business aspects were of this in terms of the results that you were able to get so that people understand what impact this really had. So the business had a very specific um, mission to try to put, uh, put vulnerabilities to a minimum. And this took a higher precedence than uh, other things uh, like speed. So Different organizations, depending on their industry, will have a different priority of their product. Uh, you will see very frequently in tech that just the speed of getting to market is the most important thing. And if something is not right, then they will roll back or create something different for it. Uh, in other places like uh, government or sometimes in finance or just different kinds of industries uh, that are more constrained, you want to ensure that there is a security and correctness of the product in place um, without, of course, affecting too much velocity. So the outcome of being able to implement this um, flexible uh, pipeline stages, shifting left with the security practices, making security uh, something that is more present in teams rather than just keeping it siloed, is that you're going to be increasing the efficiency of your teams. And once you do that, you'll be able to also increase the amount of development, which, as I already mentioned, one can quantify with the number of commits and the number of deploys that you're doing. Since all of these things were occurring uh, through a managed uh, secure, through a managed battery of testing, then at this, uh, all of these things would, would have been done under the auspices of the security team being uh, <laughs> not content. But all of these things would, qual would qualify the criteria that are needed uh, to make sure that, yes, this product is safe. This product checks all the things 
to make sure that uh, this is the kind of security that we need. So that's kind of how it was resolved, and 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 that was the output of it. So you were able to. De- uh, it, what I got from the blog post is you were actually able to deploy into production when in the past there had been barriers to that because of the security shortfalls. Yeah, is that correct. Yeah. So the advantages were really were at the edge of it. Um, so like I was saying previously, this is a kind of constrained environment. So deploys are going to be done at a very regular cadence. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that part of trying to measure how quick, how quick your deployments are, um, maybe it won't be a, as relevant since uh, there's a certain uh, cycle of deployments that are required. But in the weeks that are leading up to that deployment, you're going to have uh, much less vulnerabilities, much less kinds of last minute things that you need to be changing. So the result of that is less weekends where developers are working overtime, uh, less stressed out project managers, uh, and much happier uh, product owners with the result that, you know, the product is advancing uh, according to the schedule. I talk about it being fewer vacations canceled. <laughs> so, oh, yes. Yeah. And fewer vacations made after after each release, too. So, yeah, so. there you go. There you go. Um, so uh, when we talk about uh, work at the SEI, one of the things we always talk about, this is something you mentioned at the very beginning, is how do we transition this work into um, into other settings. So you've worked in a couple of very constrained settings. I'm sure there are some settings that you would like to try this in that are, have different constraints than the ones that you started with. Um, what are some of the things you're doing to enable transition of these practices? And what are you looking for in terms of collaborators to help you extend the use of these practices into other settings? Sure. It's kind of bridging these two different, these two worlds, right? Where there are, there have been many attempts to try to put this into a set of guidelines, what security looks like. Um, and I think uh, a great example that has been made recently that has uh, made a lot of advancements from previous guidelines was the secure software development framework uh, as uh, prescribed by NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards, uh, in the sense that it's broad enough to encompass different kinds of implementations, but specific enough to be able to give some hints to uh, senior engineers and architects as to where it is that they can uh, secure their organization and their processes. On the industry side, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of experience and there's a lot of knowledge of tools, but maybe not as much about uh, this kind of wider processes that could be implemented. So I'm very interested to be able to test more these uh, guidelines that have been made with the actual practices. And that involves playing around, you could say, with some of the parameters of it. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is a constrained environment where security and correctness is more important. What would it look like if we're trying to implement this in a place where velocity is more important? Uh, or what happens if there's a place where uh, systems can go in and out all the time? Um, and, you know, what would security look like in, in that kind of environment? So I'm very interested in that. Um, and if there's uh, collaborators who would be interested in uh, looking at uh, how we can connect industry with academia and trying to create more powerful, more resilient, um, more long-lasting uh, software, uh, then I'd be interested to talk. So any particular projects that you're working on next? Um, you know, obviously extending this into other areas, other guidelines, but are there other projects that you want to highlight that you think are interesting that we're going to want to bring you back for another podcast on? <laughs> sure. Uh, so in addition to my working here, uh, the great thing about the SCI is that um, they'll always keep you busy, uh, and not just on the same thing, but in many different things. So at the same time, uh, I've been doing some work, uh, doing software reliability engineering, uh, uh-huh. for our own data center. And it's a wonderful opportunity since, uh, you know, not all organizations have their own uh, on, on-premise cloud. And we have been doing some very exciting things in there, uh, and we're testing out, uh, best practices in the industry, and we're able to do it in our own environment. So that's a great uh, lab that you could work with. 
And another one is uh, we're creating uh, simulations with networks in things like 5G or with cell phones. And being able to do that with software um, makes that kind of work uh, a lot uh, quicker and you're able to uh, find out new things uh, rather than if you were trying to do it with uh, very uh, very specific uh, hardware. Right. So that has also been an exciting uh, piece of work that I'm doing. You're kind of doing software-defined networks in a way. That's right, yes. And Perfect. not just in the traditional sense, but also uh, in a containerized environment. Nice. Okay. So I, I see some I see some future podcasts here. So <laughs> that's very exciting. Alejandro, thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing this information with our audience. Um, I, I know that there are people out there that are, that are going, okay, I think I may be able to do this, but I might need some help. So you may get a few calls out of this. Um, I do want to uh, tell our, our audience that we'll include links in the transcripts to resources like the NIST guidelines, the secure uh, coding framework, things like that, that we talked about. Those will all be in our transcripts rather than us trying to read the URLs off to you uh, during the podcast. Um, and we also want to mention that, that uh, this podcast is based in, in great part on the recent blog post. So there's more details uh, that we didn't cover uh, on the podcast that you'll find in the blog post about how this was uh, how this actually happened. Um, I want to remind our audience that our podcasts are available on SabCloud, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and of course my favorite, the SEI YouTube channel. So if you like what you see in here today, Feel free to give us a thumbs up um, and look forward to more from Alejandro in the future, as well as other technologists that we'll be interviewing in this series. So I want to thank you all for joining us and we're now signing off. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.